want to tell you is, this is something that both Pastor Renee and I, uh, as we were talking a few weeks ago, I think Pastor Renee said something first, and I looked at him, I said, that's what's on my heart also. So it's a, it's a confirmation for both of us, and we feel that the Lord, uh, God the Holy Spirit, He's always speaking. God the Holy Spirit always has a message for His church. He always has a message for His people. And separately, without our sharing notes, um, Pastor Renee felt the Holy Spirit begin leading him to, to, uh, for the church at some point to talk about the return of the Lord in the last days. And for me as well, about a month or so ago, I really felt something, I really felt a leading in my heart as I've been thinking about it and preparing. It was, as Pastor Renee will tell you, at 1.20, 1.30 this morning, I finally said, I've got to go to, I've got to go to sleep. And, um, and, I, and I thought, Lord, is it just me or is it just sometimes, it's, sometimes messages are, are really hard uh, to, to prepare. Sometimes the enemy just really resists um, because it's a message you need to hear. Sometimes it's just, you know, pastors are human too. And, but I, we do believe that this is something, these are things, this is an area that the Lord has for us. And so we want to look at this this morning for a while. And I want to let you know that as I was, as I was thinking and preparing, I've been, collect, been looking at scriptures and meditating on scriptures, I thought for a long time about, Lord, what do I, you don't have to title something, but I felt that I should, and we usually do. And I thought, Lord, what do I, what do I title it? What do, do, what do I call it? So I really thought long and hard, and I prayed about it. And I felt that I, that I should just title it, He's Coming Soon. And so as you look at this title, I have just a really simple, practical question for you this morning that I do not want you to answer aloud. But as you saw this and, you, and as you listened to me begin to talk, I ask you, what was your initial reaction or response this morning? I just want you to think about it for just a minute. Because I think even in, uh, in a church, we'll get all sorts of responses. Um, certainly, if you, if you say something like this, and you go to television talk show hosts, for example, you know what you're going to get, right? Um, there will be laughter and, and, and somebody talking about something like this, you know, it would be, you'd see, a, you'd see a weird person standing on a street corner with a long beard and a sign, right? Saying something like, the end is near, and people looking at him like he's crazy, right? Or is that just the U.S.? Uh, maybe, maybe it's not just the... Hong Kong too, right? and most of our countries have something like that, right? Um, that the, a person who who focuses on this. So there's a very clear response. Um, there's a very clear response from people who do not have a relationship with God. So I don't want to. I don't really want to talk about that because we're the church and we have a relationship with God. So my question is to us, as people who have a relationship with God, what's our response? What's our reaction when we hear something like this or when we see something like this. Um, some of us would say, great, I'm really interested in this topic and I've been wondering when Jesus would, will come and I'm wondering who the Antichrist is. Can you tell me who the Antichrist is? Um, and a lot of people are interested, right? And a lot of people have it all figured out, right? You kind of figure out, Antichrist must be this person. I've counted up the numbers and whatever. I mean, so... The, Okay, I'm, I, I, I confess I'm making fun just a little bit. But it's true, isn't it? I mean, there's all sorts of speculation. Um, some of us would say, I don't, really, I don't really want to. It's so confusing. There's so many things. There's the vision. There's the dragon. There's the mark of the beast. It's really confusing. Let, let's not, you know, let's focus on other things. Just give me a practical message instead, not something like this. Um, some of us might say, I don't really like talking about it because this scares me. The, the end of the world and Jesus coming. I, I'm, I'm kind of scared when I think about this, so I don't really want to. I don't really want to talk about this. Some of us might say, I don't really think about this very much because my life is pretty good right now. I'm content. Uh, things are going okay. Uh, I have plans that I want to do, and and honestly, you know, if Jesus were to come soon, I I want to build a house, or I want to get married. Or, or I want to go to university. You know, um, when I was much, much, much younger, one of my prayers, of course, was Jesus come soon. That was a long, long time ago. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But one of my prayers was, Jesus, don't come until I can finish university. <laughs> and he answered that prayer. <laughs> um, and then one of my other prayers was, Jesus, don't come till I get married. <laughs> So, so far, so good. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> I used Ying as an example this morning because, as you know, Ying and Jocelyn are going to marry January 1st. And so, and we're going to talk a little bit about the tension of, of wanting Jesus to come, but also having things in this life that, that we love and that we care about and that we want to continue in a way. And I would suspect that Jocelyn and Ying might say, yes, Jesus, come back, but not before January 1st. We want to get married. Um, because we're, we're, Melrose, are you praying that one too? No. <laughs> for, for, you, are you praying my prayer? <laughs> um, so, and that's just, we laugh about these things, but honestly, people, Honestly, folks, these are real things that we think about, right? Because our hearts are also involved in this world. And I think the Bible tells us about these things. So apart from laughing and this and that, I, I do believe God tells us how we can look at this and how we can go through this world as we think about the coming of Jesus and our attachment to this world. Um, some of you might think, um, oh no, it's a prophet of doom. Je Pastor Jennifer is going to talk about the return of Jesus. Ah. And so let's look this morning at what the Bible says. I want to point out a few things as we look at this this morning to encourage you as we think about um, the coming of Jesus. By the way, when I say the coming of the Lord or the day of the Lord, I'm not getting into, is it the rapture? Is it the end of the tribulation? Is it this? Is it that? I'm just talking about the end times, because and, and it can be it can include all of that, okay? But here's what I want us to look at. Did you know that the Old Testament has more references to the second coming of Jesus than the first coming of Jesus? Did you know that? I didn't know it until I started researching it, until, until I started looking scriptures. So here's the Old Testament, and it points more to the second coming of Jesus even than the first coming of Jesus. Did you know that the New Testament refers to the coming of Jesus more than 300 times? More than, and the New Testament is a relatively, sh it's relatively short when you look at it. So more than 300 references to the coming of Jesus. And may I say something to you? Before you say, oh yeah, of course, because the book of Revelation is there. May I say to you that it's almost like salt and pepper sprinkled through the New Testament. Mentions of the return of Jesus abound in most of the books of the New Testament. There are just maybe three books that don't mention it, uh, letters that don't mention it. Galatians doesn't, and then there, uh, uh, there are some others that don't as well. But some of the others, it's f they're full, full of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that every, every single writer of the New Testament refers to Christ's second coming? Did you know that? Every single writer refers. And so... Did you know also that the number one, the, the, pri the, the uh, priority in all of these references to the coming of Jesus, the, co the command or the encouragement that you will see more than any other time, 50 times more than approximately, it's watch, be, 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 watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. There's some of them that talk about signs of the times. There's some of them that say it will be like this, it will be like that. But more than 50 times, we, we hear the encouragement and the command, watch and be ready. So we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. I want us to look together. Um, there are things that we will disagree on when we come to this. Do you know that there are sincere, Bible-believing Christians who look at the return of, the Jesus, of Jesus and feel very differently that we come to the same Bible and we come to different co conclusions? Have you found that? Absolutely different conclusions. I was doing, I've been doing some research and some reading and I was reading something I thought, what? I was, because there's some commentators that I really respect and that I study and then I looked at what they believed about the timing of the tribulation and the millennium and some of those things and I thought they believe that um, so we come to God's Word and we there are in the end times we come away with a lot of different conclusions but what we're going to talk about this morning are some things that everybody agree will agree on everybody will come to this and say you're right we can all agree on this, even though some things we don't, uh, are not so clear. And so this is where we're going to start this morning. This will be our job, jumping off point. More than 50 times, watch, be ready. Let's look at some of them, okay? And let's look just at the Gospels first. We're going to look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Therefore, you also must be ready. So you don't know when he's going to come. You must be ready. We're going to talk about how people get ready. Because some people get ready by looking at all the signs and trying to figure out exactly when it is. And if they can figure out exactly when it is, then they're ready. But I don't actually think that's what the Bible means. Okay? So we'll look at that. So Jesus says, watch. You don't know what day your Lord is coming. You must be ready. In Mark, it's recorded, take heed, watch. Okay. How many of you today, when you're speaking with your friends, you say to them, take heed. Does anyone say that? No. What would you say instead of take heed? Okay? Give us a modern, a modern translation. Anyone? It, this is an easy one, I promise. I, I'm waiting for a response. Okay, be careful. We could say, be careful. Pay attention. Look out. Look. Or, or, so, take heed. Watch. Okay? Take heed. Watch. And then in Luke, we, we also, these are all the words of Jesus. And then he also says in Luke 12, 40, you also must be ready. You also must be ready. So these are just a few. There are many more. I told you there were 50 or more, right? So it's a whole, a whole bunch of ones. I'm just taking three from the Gospels. And so we, as we move into this this morning, I've, I've, we've, we're starting here because this is probably one of the areas where people have the biggest disagreement because it points to timing, right? It points to when, when uh, and uh, along with along with how we are to be ready, but it does point to, points to timing. And, and this is where the most, I think, most disagreement is. And as I was thinking about this, and I was talking with, a little bit with Pastor Renee, I want to tell you a story, I think some of you have heard this before, where I'm from in the southern part of the United States. About 30 years ago, there was a flurry of activity in the church about the coming of Jesus. And some of you would remember it. Some of you may not have been in the church at that time. Julie may remember it. It was around 19, late 1980s. Stephen may remember it from, from, uh, from uh, uh, in Uganda as well. I don't know, but it was in the late 80s. And there was a lot of talk in the church about Jesus' coming. And it was, some, some of you will remember it. I think I said a hundred reasons, but in fact, there were all these articles online. Uh, well, the, not so much online. It was printed more. It was printed at that time, right? 1988. 88 reasons why Jesus will come in 1988. It was, it, was things, it was things like that. So there was all of this. So some of you may remember that, right? And there was a flurry of and an interest in the coming of the Lord. Now, before we say, yeah, right, what I want to say is this. We need to be careful about saying, yeah, right, because there are times throughout our history when the Holy Spirit does indeed stir hearts again for the coming of the Lord. May I give you an example? Specifically in North America, but in other areas as well, in the 70s, so that's a long time ago now, there was a stirring of the Holy Spirit and a not just a revival, a, 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 a coming to God as people's hearts were touched that Jesus was coming soon. Now that's in the 70s. That's more than or approximately 50 or so years ago. But the reason I point to that is because sitting here in the church this morning, there is someone who came to the Lord during that stirring of the Holy Spirit. Who is that? A little bit before me. It's Pastor Renee. It's Pastor Renee. And you've heard his testimony before. And she's upstairs right now, but Sister Bridget also. And both of them in that stirring of the Spirit of Jesus is coming soon. Come to the Lord. Be ready. And you've heard him give his testimony before about how that gripped his heart that night. He had no intention of turning to the Lord. He had no intention of staying with Sister Bridget. He had his life planned out. It was a mess. Now see I'm giving his testimony, right? But so far pretty accurate, right? <laughs> He was, gonna, he was going his own way. And then the Holy Spirit came with the conviction and the truth that Jesus is coming soon. And it gripped his heart. And his life was never the same. And Lighthouse has never been the same. 
and it, Sister Bridget as well. And those of you that were in the fir first service, you rem uh, some of you remember Larry O'Malley, the American brother. He was upstairs in meet and greet, and he looked at me, he nodded, he said, yeah, me too. He's a, he's a, a very, very successful businessman in the U.S., and he was in the, in the first service. He too, just a wicked life, right? A, a, dis a, a, a dissolute life. And it was during that time when the Holy Spirit gripped his heart. So indeed, there are times when the Holy Spirit stirs to bring people to himself. The Holy Spirit's always working, right? Some of us, everybody around us may be doing nothing, but the Holy Spirit speaks to us because he, he, come, he, he knows our hearts. But then there are other times when there's a move. Frankly, I sense in my spirit that this also, not just at Lighthouse, I think this is one of the times, again, of the stirring of the spirit that Jesus is coming soon. I, I really, I, I, I feel that. And some of you, some of you are kind of nodding. Some of you are going, hmm, or whatever. But the Holy Spirit can bring us along into his timeline. And so we want to be careful about poo-pooing it and saying, yeah, right. Okay, but this particular one that I'm telling you about that I started was in 1988 and um, there was a, a very prominent businessman in our area in South Alabama in the U.S. and some of you heard me tell the story before. He got hooked up with this 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 1988 and he owned a music company very much like Tom Lee here in Hong Kong so it was extremely successful I mean it was a big music company um, and he along with his sons had this they had stores here and there and um, he supplied musical equipment and other things throughout our state so it was, it was a big deal and he got hooked up this is when Jesus is coming they were sincere they loved God and what they did as they became convinced of that was they took their company and about a month before the date they sold the company completely sold it and I think probably sold it as I recall now at a very low price because if Jesus is coming soon you don't need money a lot of money right I, I, honestly I mean honestly and actually we talk about these things this does point to some people think about these things this this has to do with coming of uh, coming of the Lord and so they sold, their, they sold their company, they sold their business, and they waited for Jesus to come in 1988. Well, as we know, Jesus did not come in, in 1988, and the family suffered uh, shame, disregard, and they suffered greatly financially because they had basically sort of almost given away their company, and then all of the families, because it was the father and it was all of the sons, along with their wives and children, had, had nothing. Um, when that time passed and so we have we have that so we have those that say that that really that look at everything and and feel like okay now I, I can figure it out I know when I know when Jesus is coming now the Bible does tell us that there are signs that we can look at but we have to be careful and so I want us to look first at a few scriptures um, if we are a date if we are date setting people, okay, if you kind of look at, you're trying to figure things out, or if you're thinking, I think I've got it figured out, I think I know who the Antichrist is, okay, then some of you may be going down that road as well. I want us to look at some things in the Bible, uh, the inspired, infallible Word of God that tell us about the timing of the last days, okay? And let's look at what, first of all, let's look at what Paul says. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you. What do you mean you don't need to write us? <laughs> you don't need to write us about this? Stay with me. What else does he say? For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. May I say something first of all? Look at this just a second. Some of us know a little bit more about uh, New Testament history. Some of us don't know so much. But let me tell you something about the Thessalonian church. Do you know that this church in, in uh, Thessalonica was a brand new church, okay? In fact, when Paul wrote this, this perhaps was, this church was perhaps only a month or so old, maybe two months old. This was a brand new church. 
This was a baby church, if you will, okay? Really a baby church. And I want you to notice this. Paul writes to them. He's, he's been apart from them. Not, it's not been a long time. He was only with them, as far as we can figure out, for about three weeks. And then he was run off, okay? And he, he had to leave Thessalonica. But look at this. Part of his teaching for brand new Christians, for a baby church, one of the foundational teachings was, Jesus is coming soon. Now, we probably wouldn't pick something like that, would we? We would probably think, okay, I need to tell you about church membership, about church attendance, about tithing, about this, about that. Those are all important things, but what I want us to see is this this morning. One of the things that Paul, the greatest preacher and pastor of the New Testament, we would say, one of the things that was central was, you, you new Christians, you've got to know Jesus is coming soon. And you've got to be ready. That's what Paul said. And so he writes to them and he says, okay, I don't need to write you about it because you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, a thief in the night, those of you that have seen those movies from the 1970s, that was the title of one of the most uh, gripping. gripping, that's the right word, one of the most gripping movies, Christian movies, Thief in the Night. That was one that, and it was taken, it's taken exactly from this and from other passages. So Paul says, first of all, it's going to come like a thief in the night. Now, what does Peter say? Look at the next passage, 2 Peter 3.10. The day of the Lord will come, how? Like a thief. Almost the same thing. Look at Mark 13, 32, the words of Jesus. What does he say? No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, by the way, Jesus said this when he was walking on earth as a man, but Jesus is now in heaven. So my question is, does Jesus now know about that timing? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely, he knows. But when he walked on the earth as a man, he limited, he willingly submitted himself to the Father, limited himself in power and in knowledge. He did not know the timing of these things. Of course he knows now that he's in heaven. So I want us to look at these three. Here's something for you right now so that you can hang on to and hold on to. If anybody tells you, I have it figured out, I have a revelation from the Lord, I don't care how persuasive they are, I don't care how persuasive they are. I don't care if I'm the one who says, I've got it figured out. I'll tell you, I'll tell you when. I didn't get it from God. And nobody else has gotten it from God either. We don't know when he's coming. It's going to come like a thief in the night. We don't know when thieves come. If we knew when they were coming, we'd be, we'd be, we'd be on guard against them, right? How many of you have ever had your house broken into by a thief in the night? Anyone? Okay. Alistair has, so that must have been, what country, Alistair? Uh, in the UK. Mm. <laughs> Andrew has, Hong Kong, how am I? Okay, in Hong Kong. Cindy, Philippines. Ah, so it means any country, anytime, anywhere, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So the description, the, the way it is, it's like a thief in the night. We never know when a thief is, when a thief in, in the night is coming, do we? We never know. And it's not, so I think we really need to pay attention to that terminology because it's the terminology that's used throughout the New Testament over and over and over and over and over again. So that lets us know this is what we don't know about the coming of the Lord. Okay? And so if anybody tells you this is when Jesus is coming, I've got it figured out, you take what they say, you throw it in the trash can. They definitely did not get it from God. That's number one. Okay? So very, very, very sure. Now, can we have a sense as we look at the world and at events and at the move of history? Can we have a sense of general timing? I think we can. I believe we can because the Bible talks about these things that are going on and these things that are happening. But I want to say something to you as well. Not to dampen your fire and not to dampen your zeal for the coming of the Lord. But I do want to tell you this. Throughout history, there have been times of great persecution when the church has believed, Jesus, this has to be tribulation. Jesus, you must be coming. You must be coming. This is what the Bible describes. And so I don't say that to, to dampen your zeal for the coming of the Lord. But what I want to say is, we don't know. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. 
because it does matter. It does matter. And there are things that we can do and that we should do. Okay? So this is on one side. Those that have everything figured out, have all the signs, I found this in the Bible, and this means this, 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 and this. And I pretty much got it figured out. I don't know the hour, but I think I know the month, <laughs> okay? <laughs> which, which some, uh, honest, and so there's this on one side, and I'm not, believe me if you say, but I do, I'm looking for the return of the Lord. I am not mocking that. I'm not mocking that. But that's on one side. And then I want us to look at the other side as well. And I want us to look at another scripture. There, we don't want to be in those who set, we don't want to be in the camp with those who set dates. But on the other hand, we don't be, want to be in the camp with those who scoff at the coming of the Lord. And Peter talks about that. Look at these verses. By the way, if you want a reading assignment, because you know you're not busy at all um, here in Hong Kong, but if you want a reading assignment, go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and just read, read, read. The whole chapter is about the coming of the Lord. It's so, it's so good. We don't have time to go into all of it this morning. But look at what Peter says. He says, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. And they will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. Now that's how Peter writes it. So we don't want to find ourselves in one camp looking for every sign and saying it must be this. Nor do we want to find ourselves in the camp that scoffs at the coming of the Lord and to say, to put it in, in 21st century speak, yeah, I've heard this before. Jesus is coming again. And honestly, we have heard that at times, haven't we? And honestly, in our hearts at times, we sometimes have thought that just a little bit. Sure, I've heard about the coming of Jesus all my life. By the way, I'm almost 60 years old. Do you know that from the time I was a small, small child, I have heard, I, I'm, Andrew, I'm not as old as you are, but I'm getting there. Andrew's laughing now. <laughs> I'm hoping he thought I was much younger. <laughs> so, from the time I was a small child, I have heard the message of the return, the soon return of Jesus. The soon return of Jesus. And the problem with hearing something repeatedly over time that has not yet taken place is that our hearts can get hard. Or our hearts can get very complacent to the truth, right? And even though we are Christians, we can start to feel like, yeah, I know, I've, but I've heard that. I've heard so many sermons about the coming of Jesus. Yeah, sure. Yeah, he's coming soon. But look, to put it in modern language, you say Jesus is coming soon, but look, everything in the world is just the same as it always always was. Things haven't changed. Life is still, in, still going on as it always was. They said, did you know that when Hitler came to power um, in Europe, that many people said he is the Antichrist. He's the Antichrist. But he wasn't, was he? Was he a type of Antichrist? Probably. Many people said Stalin in Russia was, he must be the Antichrist. So, so wicked. So many put to death. Uh, Christians uh, um, persecuted and things like that. And, and there are many who might even say, yeah, they said he was, they said he was. But look, the world is still going on. And what, we, what I say this morning is, if, we, if our hearts are starting to feel that way, then we're in danger and we find ourselves in this camp. And Peter says, there are scoffers. That's one of the signs of the last days. And what I want you to notice is this, brothers and sisters. Peter is not talking about late night TV talk show hosts, okay? I, you know I'm from the U.S., and I, maybe other countries have them as well. The most common form of television, of TV shows, late at night, are all the talk shows. There, there's always, uh, there's something funny. Uh, they'll give like a monologue or whatever, and then they'll have all these guests on it. And probably most countries have things like this as well. But if you want to find scoffing and mockery, mockery of God's things, you go there, and you'll find it there. A person who, who who would be generally value, valued as honest or somebody with true Christian beliefs or that truly t thinks about the coming of the Lord. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, it would just be, they would be the butt of so many jokes. Um, and so if you want mockery and scoffing, you go there. 
may I say something to you this morning? Peter, I'm, I'm using modern language, Peter's not talking about Hollywood or late night TV talk show hosts, is he? Who's Peter talking about here? Who's he talking about? He's talking about people who have heard truth and know truth. He's talking about people who are religious people, who are religious people. So that tells me that there's a danger here for us as well, that we can, come, we can get in that camp. We can start going that way as well. Oh, I've heard about Jesus coming. I've heard about him coming. He hasn't come yet. He hasn't come yet. And there can be in our hearts almost a mockery and a scoffing that Jesus will come soon. And I think that's, that, is a, that is a possibility for every Christian. And so we don't want to be there as well. And Peter says, remember this. I want to remind you of this. They're, they've heard the truth, and their hearts have become hardened by the truth. So, you don't want to be somebody who sets dates. You don't want to be somebody who scoffs. Yeah, right, sure. Who knows when he's coming? What do you want to be, and where do you want to be? Well, let's look at what Peter says, and let's go a little bit further in this passage. Peter answers them first, and here's an answer for us. And Peter gives a reply to their argument with another argument of his own, but it's kind of an unusual argument. And when you first read it, you think, huh? Why does Peter say this in response to where is his coming? Why does Peter say they forget that God made the heavens by the word of his mouth? Um by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out of, from water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. Why does Peter say this, and how can it help us? Let's put it in modern language again. What Peter is saying here, this is in 2 Peter 3, 5 through 6, read the whole chapter. Peter uses this argument because they say, hey, nothing's changed. Everything's the same. Sure. Are you sure Jesus is coming? And Peter says, they forget that in the beginning, Everything was the same. Nothing had happened. Things were just as they are, always were. And with the word of God, creation came into being. Just like that. Just like that. Suddenly, at his command, at his word. So there's the first example he gives. Therefore, if, G if God did that then, in his coming, he can do something like this again. And then the second example he gives is Noah and the ark. And I was thinking about that because remember... Noah began to preach. And I was talking with Pastor Fayez about this uh, some months ago. So Pastor Fayez and I were talking about it. Here's Noah. God says, judgment's going to come, but I'm going to save you. Does that sound like the coming of Jesus? It does, doesn't it? And Noah starts preaching to everybody. Jesus, uh, not, gee, sorry. He says, judgment is coming, but you can be saved. He's, he's preaching repentance. Repent and you can be saved. How long does Noah preach? How, how long? You say some of you... I'm not sure. Okay, I'll give you the answer. 120 years, okay, approximately. He preached for 120 years. Hey, you all get tired of 20 years of sermons from Pastor Renee and Pastor Jennifer. <laughs> what if you heard 120 years and pretty much the same message for 120 years? Repent. Judgment is coming. Repent and be saved. And he starts to build the ark. He starts to build the ark. Now, when Peter uses this, this argument and this example, it really should speak to our hearts because Peter again is saying the same thing. Before that time, had it ever rained? Ever? No. How ha but, so how had things, how had, how had plants been watered? Was there, was there a drought? No. What does the Bible say? God would send every night dew, dew, so it must have been a very heavy dew that would come upon the land. And that's how the earth was watered before that time. So along comes this man. He's got to be crazy because he builds a boat bigger than any boat that has ever been seen. And he doesn't build it right by the river. And he doesn't build it right by the sea. He builds it on dry land. And then... He says something crazy like water is going to fall out of the sky and there's going to be a flood. They'd never heard of that before and they'd never seen that before. 
And here's the argument. Though they had never seen it, though they had never experienced it, it was nevertheless true. Did it take a long time to happen? Yes, 120 years. And so Peter uses this example for you and for me this morning as well, as for the readers at that time, and for those who, was, who were listening to this message at that time. We haven't seen it before. We haven't experienced it before. We've been waiting a long time, but all of those things do not deny or negate the truth of the coming of the Lord Jesus and the judgment of God. And so that's why Peter uses those examples. And then he says something else. What does he say? Look at the next passage. He says, don't forget, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. How many mathematicians do we have here? How many people good with numbers this morning? Okay, Moses, he has to because, you know, he's an engineer. If, if he's not good with numbers, I don't want to go into his building <laughs> that, he, that he has designed. Okay, good with numbers. Some people have come to this passage and they've said, oh, this is how God looks at things. A thousand years is like a day and therefore, bop, 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 and they make a, uh, they make a, a uh, uh, not a theory, they make a, 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 a like, X plus equation. They make it, thank you. Okay, another engineer over here. Okay, they make an equation. If it's this, 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 and this, and they figure it out. That's not what Peter is saying, okay? That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is God views time differently than we view time. A thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. That's the first thing he's saying. So when we say, oh, we waited so long. Where is his coming? God looks at it differently. The second thing he says is this. Don't forget He's patient for a reason. He's not just slow. He's not just slow. He's patient for a reason. And what is the reason? Grace, mercy, and love that we might be saved. That we might be saved. For the Christian, for us this morning, there's always this, there should be, I think, this struggle in our hearts, this, this, this tension in our hearts part of us because the Holy Spirit lives in us. Does he live in you? Yes. He lives in you. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does when he's in your life and you are letting him work in your life and you're responding to him, the Holy Spirit will draw your heart and draw your attention to the coming of the Lord. That's one of his jobs. Did you know that? That's one of his jobs, and it's in, it's in Revelation 22. I don't think we'll get there this morning. That's one of the works of the Holy Spirit. He draws us. But by the same token, there is that part of us. We say, yes, come Lord Jesus. But because we are in this world, there's that other part of us that does say, but Jesus, not yet. People aren't ready. Wait. I haven't, this person has not yet responded to you. Do you know that I think about that sometimes? I live, you know, you've, I've, you've, heard, you've heard me talk before about living in this village in Kaolong Hang and about going to the gym where I go and, and there's some of these trainers in the gym that I'm praying for and I'm trying to figure out how to share the gospel with them somewhere between Cantonese and Mandarin. And it's not so easy for me, but I pray for them because they don't know Jesus at all, at all. I gave you the example of the one guy, he didn't even know what a Bible was. Didn't even know what a Bible was. And so I'm praying for them and sharing when I can. So there's this tension in us as a Christian. Brothers and sisters, we should be longing for the return of Christ. If we're not, then there's probably something stale about our relationship with Jesus. Uh, and I'm just speaking really frankly. There, there probably is something that's just, that needs refreshing and reviving. There's something stale because the Spirit of God in us, you read Revelation 22, the Spirit in us says, come, Lord Jesus. That's, what, that's, one, of his, that's one of his calls. Come, Lord Jesus. So there's that part. But the Spirit of the Lord in us also longs for the grace of God and the salvation of God to come to as many as possible. And so it's this tension in us. And, the, and it will be there, I think, until, until Jesus comes. And so we see this. And it's on both sides. But what I want to say to you this morning is, I'm afraid at times, more often than not, 
we as Christians, we don't find ourselves here setting dates. We don't find ourselves here scoffing, but we find ourselves somewhere in the middle and we just don't think about it very much. And Paul writes about it in Philippians. Look at this passage. It's in Philippians 3. And you can read the whole passage for yourselves. But what I want you to look at is this. He says there are people who are part of the church. There are people who Paul knows them. They're part, listen, they're part of the fellowship of Christians. They really are. Maybe they're churchgoers. Let's use modern, let's use modern language. They're churchgoers or they're religious people. They're not ungodly pagans out there somewhere to use that expression. They're churchgoers. They're people who are part of the fellowship. And Paul looks at them and the way that they're living and he cries and weeps over them because of the way that they live, because of their outlook. Look what he says. He says, they're not really, their lives, they're enemies of Christ's death on the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, bodily desires. In other words, it's the things that satisfy my natural man. Wealth, fame, money, sex, uh, 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 acclaim, uh, all sorts of things like that. Food, including food. All of these things. All of these things. And he says, this is, what they're, this is what feeds them. Let me put it that way. This is what feeds them. And he's talking about people who are part of Christian fellowship. And then he, ends, he says they're proud of what they should be ashamed of. And they think of only, and this is the part, and they think only of the things that belong to this world. And what scares me is, at times when I think of Christians, is this. Are we like that? Our lives are so full of this world. Parents, it may be that you're thinking almost always, almost only about your children in school here in Hong Kong. I got to get them into the right school. They've got to do this. They've got to do that. I've got to plan this. I've got to plan that. And because that's filling your thoughts, it's your priority in how you plan your life and how you plan their lives. And I want to say something to you this morning. If that is your priority, and I'm just using that as an example. If that is your priority, then I am fearful that you find yourself in this, thinking only of the things that belong to this world. Or maybe you're saving up all of your money and all of your energy and all of your plans are, I'm saving up money so I'm going to, and I'm planning, and on this day, I'm going to go back to the Philippines and I'm going to build a house. Now, some of you are laughing because that's exactly what you're doing, right? <laughs> You're planning right now, right? You're saving money and you're getting ready to build a house. Am I judging you? I'm not judging you. Is it wrong to save money to build a house? No, it is not wrong to save money to build a house. In fact, Jesus makes it very clear. You're living in this world and while you're waiting for my return, there are things you should be doing as you live in this world because we are in this world and there are needs of this world. But if that's the limit, and that's what the point is, uh, uh, include this, uh, J.B. Phillips translates it, paraphrases it this way. This world is the limit of their horizon. This world is the limit of their horizon. So our question, my question to you, our question for ourselves this morning is, how far are we looking? What's the limit of our horizon? Is the limit of your horizon primarily the things of this world? That's where your attention is. That's where you're focusing. That's where most of your money is. That's where most of your plans are. The limit of this, it's this horizon. I don't see beyond. Or are you looking beyond? Are you looking at what is more? Are you looking at what is yet to come? If you are not, then you find yourself here this morning. And then P Paul turns right around. He says, but we or we, however, are citizens of heaven and we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. And here's this comparison of the two. And so my question to you this morning, in all honesty, and this is between you and God, it's between you and the Holy Spirit who's living in you this morning, where do you, where do I find myself this morning? Am I here or can I say I'm here? I'm here. God help us. The Holy Spirit works 
to remind us we are citizens of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. May I say something this morning? Please don't take this the wrong way. Please, I really mean this. What I have found in my own life and what I have seen in other Christians is this. When we go through really hard struggles, when we go through hard times of loss and grief and, and, and change and upheaval, it may be within our bodies with health, it may be in our families, it may be loss, a loss of loved one, really serious things. What I have found for the Christian is this. When the Holy Spirit is working in our lives and our hearts, almost always extended times of difficulty and tribulation tend to turn our hearts more towards hope, the hope that's found in Jesus. Really, hope that's found in Jesus. And would we ever want trouble and hard times to come? Of course not. I wouldn't wish it on my enemy, nor would you. But these things come to everyone. When they do, when they do, let the Holy Spirit, in addition, in, in addition to comforting you, do His work, which is to point you towards the hope that is in Jesus only. The hope that's in Jesus only. Not all storms will be stilled. Not all answers will come as we want them to. And you've heard me say from my own life, God, why won't you answer this the way that I want you to? You could so easily. But we hold on to Jesus. We hold on to Jesus in these times. And when we hold on to Jesus, brothers and sisters, he, he lifts our eyes beyond this horizon. When you and I are in tribulation and in difficulties, I don't know about you, but it seems like my face is in the mud sometimes and I can't breathe. Maybe you feel that way too. But the Holy Spirit, hold on to Him. And what He does in these times, whatever is worked out, whatever answer comes or doesn't come, is this. He will lift your eyes to something beyond the limits of this world, that there's hope in Him. There's, that's His job. That's what He does. I encourage you, and we're going to come to, we're going to, we're going to stop here. It's time to stop. I encourage you this week. We're not going to get this far. But actually, just, just put it up on the screen. Uh, Wilma, uh, slide 12. And you can just click all of them. Here's a little, here's a, here's a taste for you. But you need to go back for yourself. Go to Revelation 22. And I encourage you with this because these are the last words of the last book of the Bible, of the last days. And all of it is pointed towards Jesus, you're coming. Jesus, you're coming. And Jesus says, I'm coming, I'm coming soon. And the Holy Spirit in us replies, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. In there is a salvation message also. Are you thirsty? If the world is the limit of your horizon, I want to tell you something this morning. You're going to get thirsty. If you're not thirsty now, you're going to get thirsty. If you think some person, some relationship down here is going to satisfy you and bring you happiness and make everything better, you're going to get thirsty. But you come to Him and He satisfies. He satisfies. And this is how the, this is how the Word of God ends, brothers and sisters, the inspired Word of God. Jesus says, I'm coming soon, I'm coming soon. The bride, that's us, replies and says, come soon, Jesus, come soon. The Holy Spirit in the church stirs us to say, yes, come soon. And John, as he finishes, writes, 
Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That, that's what John himself says. And could we just close this morning with the simple words, Amen. Amen. Amen means I agree with it. You know, that, that's the modern translation. Amen is I agree with this. Could we say together from our hearts, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's just, just, take, just close your eyes as we close right now and just say with me, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's say it again. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus, we come to you. We ask your spirit to do its work in our hearts. Lord, some of us have been trying to find dates and figure out all the things. Lord, some of us confess we have gotten to the point where we have almost started to mock and disregard your coming. And Lord, a whole bunch of us, we're right in the middle and we confess our our hearts and our gaze and our thoughts and our affections have become consumed by the things of this world and it's become the limit of our horizon. Would you by your spirit lift our eyes beyond the limit of this horizon because we're citizens of heaven and you're coming soon. Lord, speak to your church as you have this morning and throughout this week. We want to watch and be ready. We want to take heed and be ready, even though we don't know when it is. Lord, we're never going to call you a liar because you say you're coming soon. And so we say, okay then, Jesus, we're going to watch and we're going to be ready. And Lord, if we're not yet ready, help us get ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen.